I want to start off by talking about play. I'm, I'm fairly fascinated by play. I wrote a book, the first book I wrote was about video games. And it was for a very simple reason, really. I mean, I suppose some people say I wish to uh, get something out of all the hours I've wasted on my favorite hobby. But play fascinates me because it is so deep, so universal, so powerful. A little picture here of animals being playful. You know, play is not just a human impulse. Play is, is the impulse of higher creatures. It's a very slippery thing to define. But if we look at the 20th century, I think you know, one of the amazing stories of the 20th century was the way that through, through mass media, watching people play, perhaps specifically football, became literally you know, the greatest collective experience in human history. More people at one stage watched the last Football World Cup than had ever belonged to any kind of world religion. And now we have mass interactive media. And I think one of the great stories of the 21st century is already proving to be mass participation in play. But also, I think it's an interesting key for unlocking some aspects of the present and future, because when it comes to technology, there's so many amazing things going on. It's very, very hard to know sort of what we can hold on to. But I think one thing we can hold on to is, is the human, is us, is that sort of unchanging core of the, of the boggling modern world. And you know, if you look at technology and play, you have people who are not being paid to do something, and it's not useful in any utilitarian sense. It's people wanting to do something and giving of themselves in, in really, frankly, staggering amounts of time and money and attention. So for me, this is an interesting place to begin when talking about the future. Uh, these are a few conservative stats for the global video games industry. They're very conservative, in fact. Uh, you could easily, if you take hardware into account, already sort of push that one up closer to the sort of 85 billion mark in the present. But we have the world's fastest growing media industry, bar none, and one that apart from television is already the world's most valuable. And you know, who knows where it will end? It will end somewhere big. But what I want to do is, is explore something slightly different, which is the idea for me that play humanizes technology. This isn't, but could be, a photo of myself and my brother engaged in fanatical Street Fighter II combat in, in the late 1980s. But the interesting thing for me about play and computers is how consistently it has been at the cutting edge of our interactions and our emotional relationships with machines. Back in 1962, not that long ago, it's very easy to forget that a computer, a digital device, was a daunting thing. They were very, very hard to use, very, very expensive, very rare big boxes you know, that cost, in today's money, hundreds of thousands of dollars that you really needed you know, to be studying a degree or a postgraduate degree in some kind of mathematical subject to approach. And they got a little smaller. And in 1962, at MIT, where so much stuff seems to have happened, a computer called a PDP-1, the Personal Data Processor 1, was there, and people were using it. And a bunch of people, led by a guy called Stephen Slug Russell, decided that they wanted to come up with a way of showing how awesomely powerful this new technology was. And they figured that you know, this, this thing that crunched numbers, it was better than that. It was more awesome. So they wanted to make a killer app that showed the power of this box. And they decided that a game was that killer app. Because a game, unlike even the most complicated of, of algorithms, was something that you should be able to approach without expertise and without expectations that you should be able to interact with in real time and get a response from. And so they made this thing called Space War, which was, frankly, by the standards of today's <coughs> games, absolutely rubbish. But what it was is a star field. One of you controlled one ship, one of you controlled another ship. And when I say ship, I mean triangle. In the middle was a black hole with gravity sucking you in. You could shoot missiles, and when I say missiles, I mean a missile, and when I say a missile, I mean a white pixel, and you flew around and shot at each other and tried to avoid the black hole. But the amazing thing was, this is well before the invention of the mouse, and this is something that an ordinary person without a degree could come up to on this most complicated, daunting, rare, and expensive of machines and control in real time, in conjunction with someone else, an object on screen, and want to do it. This went viral. 
as much as something could in 1962. They started programming it into all the new PDP-1s and PDP-2s, indeed. So, 1962. Now, fast forward to 2010, and some of you may recognize, I've written the word on, on the board, so. Kinect, the fastest selling, according to Guinness, fastest selling consumer electronics device in history. Eight million plus copies in the first 60 days on sale. And what the Kinect is, as you probably know, is a stereoscopic camera setup with some quite clever sort of AI that can model the joints in your body, camera, microphone as well. You stand in front of your Xbox, as I want to do. You wave your hands around. And on screen, that is mapped precisely in real time onto an avatar who, who, who may or may not look like you that does stuff as well. And the staggering thing for me is that not that this is the now, but that this, you know, the absolute, in many ways, an absolute cutting edge interface with technology, because it was released in a playful medium, is now in, you know, more than 10 million homes being used by people who have gone out and bought it, you know, in, in their millions, because it is playful, because the entire structure of it is designed for pleasure, to make it accessible, to, to bring you into the world. And this is the interesting point for me, that the cutting edge of technology in so many ways, it's about us more than it's about the machine. It's about what we're like and what we want. And so I want to talk about this word, immersion. And it's a very interesting word. It's a slightly sort of mystical word. That's why I've got jellyfish. Mystical, sort of, mystical jellyfish. Um, because we've had ideas about machines and immersion for quite a long time. If I go back to, to my childhood, when I was sitting with my brother, in front of a console, down like this, we all absolutely thought that, you know, now, I wouldn't be standing here and you wouldn't be sitting there. We would all be in Tron, or Tron Legacy, which is, which is worse but looks better. And, <laughs> and we would, you know, we would pull up on our, on our bikes and, uh, and you know, we would, we would be immersed in a virtual world in the sense, like under the water, like swimming around. And in fact, what interests me is that although, you know, technology my goodness me, but hasn't it grown? But we are not, as far as I'm aware, in Tron. Um, I, w I could make an interesting sub-note there, but I, but I, but I won't. Um, my theory's about Tron for another time. What we're all doing is playing Angry Birds. Um, this may sound slightly facetious, but I play video games quite a lot, professionally obliged to. Uh, World of Warcraft, one of the world's most successful immersive in the sense of it's not around my head, but it's a 3D world. You know, 11, 12 million people paying to play that. Angry Birds, half a billion downloads to date and counting, and counting really quite fast. And what the interesting point for me is that the immersion in this cute little Kill the Pigs cartoon world is an emotional immersion of a very different kind because the experience it gives people is one of if you like, temporary absolute escape and absorption. Now, you know, a lot of famous people play Angry Birds. I believe the Prime Minister and the Chancellor both want to play it on their iPads. And one of the things about something like Angry Birds is you can dip into it for a second and be taken away from everything around you, be completely absorbed, be having fun. Fun of a very sophisticated kind in its, in its simple way. And that level of emotional immersion, what play can do, that intersection of what is convenient for us, that for me is a very interesting trajectory because we're not in Tron, but we are playing Angry Birds. So where does that point? Well, uh, this, is, this is Photoshop, I, I, I'm sad to add, um, sadly. But for me, it leads to one of the most interesting trends that technologically we are seeing everyone doing things that even a short time ago a small number of people were doing. Games. Now, the traditional image of the gamer is, frankly, me 15 years ago. Spectacles, console, darkness, no girlfriend, you know, that kind of thing. But now, you know, the average user of Farmville is a woman in her 50s. The average player of Angry Birds is just a person who's alive, who's got a pulse, who's sort of under 70. It's for everyone. And for me, this is about a trajectory in technology from what you might call personal computing that great revolution where the computers went into the homes, which was not, you know, not predicted, to intimate computing, where computing becomes something that is simply 
easy for us to do, that is integrated into our souls, into our lives, that is universal, hence the iPad, in a way that perhaps only play has sort of hinted at previously. There is something, I believe, playful, or if you will, hedonic in it, i.e. pleasure-driven, about what we want, what we are like, what is easy for us. So when I talk about the power of virtuality, I'm not talking, I'm not interested in a distant future in which we vanish into virtuality. I'm interested in a near future that, in a sense, is, is at our fingertips. So when I see someone like that commuting, I think to myself, the iPhone, the phone, is the first thing we touch when we wake up in the morning, the last thing we touch when we go to bed at night, the touch screen. It's all about ease of use. The great progression, the great revolution, has not been faster, faster, whiz, bang in the last few years. In a sense, it's been easier, easier, more convenient, more universal. We, each of us, are beginning to virtualize aspects of our lives all the time, easily, seamlessly, pleasurably, wherever we go. And I, mean, I think this dovetails quite closely with some of the amazing things that Ian was, was talking about before I came on the stage. Now, again, I'm talking about the technological present. This is a zoom in on an RFID chip, radio frequency identification chip. And this is an interesting part of a phrase you may have already heard in this conference, the, the Internet of Things, as they call it. Slightly sinister phrase, could be a horror movie, but what it's about is this idea that objects, objects in our lives, will start having, if you like, a digital existence, a presence within the virtual world. This sends out a short wave radio signal, which can be picked up by a reader at short range, and that the price of making these has gone down a lot recently. One quick example. South Korea, they love whiskey. It's very expensive. There's a lot of piracy problems. They're a very technologically literate society. Therefore, if you're buying a posh whiskey in South Korea now, each one of them will have one of these chips embedded in it with a unique identifier code and URL link. I get my phone, which has got an RFID reader in, as all South Korean new phones do. I weave it in the vicinity of my whiskey, and it tells me whether that's an authentic bottle or not. It is authentic. I crack it open to have, have a beverage, uh, and I break the chip by opening it, and that chip with its unique number has now vanished from the world, and one knows that that uniquely manufactured whiskey cannot be nicked. Now, for me, that's interesting because it's easy, but also because of the blurring that's going on. The data, the use, is seamless. And so the question I ask when I'm talking about people is, in a way, what freaks us out and what doesn't? What do we enjoy? What, where's the future going in terms of our feelings and pleasure? This is a picture from Toyota Friend being launched in the next couple of years, a social network for your car, where you can check in with your car, and because of remote sensors, it will tell you, beep, 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 I need to be charged up if I'm electric. I'm broken, take me for a service. You can talk to other Toyota users. It can be done. The question is, do you want to do it? This, a different note, is a shot from Armour 2, a video game. Or, if you work for people who make documentaries for ITV, it's an IRA training video. They... <laughs> They showed this on television and said it was an IRA training video. Unfortunately, it was a video game. But this blurring of bounds, what are we comfortable with, what aren't we comfortable with, that for me, in terms of pleasure, in terms of emotion, this is a very interesting question because if I look at a half billion people doing something, it's what people do, it's where intimacy leads us. And this, again, ties into what Ian was saying. This is, this is my sort of a mock-up I've taken of someone who going jogging with an augmented reality contact lens-based jogging app. It's layering data over the world. It's virtualizing the world. And it's doing it in a way that is profoundly useful and seamless. And this, for me, I suppose, is what happens when I think about immersion. Not vanishing into Tron. And not, perhaps, you know, doing crazy other things, but blurring the bounds between the real and the virtual continuously in small ways through intimacy through a layer that is spread seamlessly over everything we do. The great quote from a great man, reality is merely an illusion, albeit a very persistent one. This is not Albert. This is a South Korean impersonator, in fact, because they, they do that kind of thing along with putting <laughs> chips in whiskey. But this is, this is the key point for me, that when we're talking about technology, perhaps 
What matters more than anything is us, is the reality of our feelings, is the human reality, is the emotions these things generate. It is why I'm interested in play and pleasure. It's why I'm interested in people. It's why I'm interested in trying to ask about immersion as what we are prepared to give ourselves to and take as real and important and valid in our lives rather than merely what can we do. And that's the thought I would like to leave you with. Thank you very much.